Luke chapter 7, verses 19 through 23. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men that were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, lover of men's souls, Savior of lost mankind, God of the universe, we thank you, Lord, today for the word of God. We thank you for the presence of the Lord in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the reality that we know today that Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. We know because he cleansed us and made us righteous and holy in his sight. And today, God, we've experienced that cleansing. Master, in the name of Jesus, the word of God must now go forth. And for the word of God to be of any benefit or any help to the people of God, it must be, it must be accompanied by the anointing, the power, and the presence of a living God. Lord, today I stand before you humbly. I make myself available, O God, to you. Let your word flow through me. Let the Spirit of the Lord reach out to broken hearts, to wounded lives, to broken souls. Help God today your word to accomplish that for which it is sent. Today, God, save those that are lost. Reclaim the backslider. Heal those that are sick by your word. Deliver God from demonic oppression today by your word. Let the word of God today be anointed of the Holy Ghost. For the anointing is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch us both the speaker and the hearer, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. John the Baptist was in prison. It was very near the end of his life. Things were winding up and he knew that that was the case. He had already declared Jesus the Christ. As he stood by the banks of the Jordan River. But suddenly he found himself in the position of uncertainty. You see folks there is nothing wrong with occasionally having to battle with your faith. I have a brother who uh, suggested to me once that uh, you know people are brainwashed into believing the gospel and people are raised in church and therefore they're they're raised from their earliest days to believe this you know and that they never question it because it's been drilled into their head that this is so and I looked at him and I said oh son you couldn't be any more wrong 
There have been many times in the course of my life when I've had to stop for a moment and look again, hello now, at the gospel. Look again at Calvary. Look again at the manger. Look again at the tomb. And I had to decide all over again whether or not I still believe this message to be true. Hello now. I'm going to tell you, anybody that's human, anybody with flesh and bone is going to go through periods where you question and you wonder. And here John was reaching the end of his life, and he had already made the declaration on the banks of the Jordan River, Behold the Lamb of God! Hallelujah! He had already declared Jesus to be the Messiah, the Promised One, and yet all of a sudden... He finds himself once again in a position of doubt and he's not certain. Have I done everything God called me to do? Have I accomplished everything? Oh Lord, I hope I didn't make a declaration concerning the wrong man. Because if I made a declaration concerning the wrong man, that means the right man is still out there and, and I haven't done what you've asked me to do to declare him and to proclaim him. Many nights I go to sleep and I, or I, I go to lay down to go to sleep and I question and I think, Lord, if you were to take me home tonight, have I done everything you called me to do? Have I done my job? Have I done it well? Have I accomplished everything? Lord, I don't want to leave any task undone. I don't want to leave uh, any laces untied, any T's uncrossed, any uh, eyes undotted. I want to have done, when this race is over, I want to have done everything I was supposed to do. And that's the position that John found himself in. So he sent some of his disciples to Jesus. And they were asking him. John wanted a clear declaration from the Lord himself. He wanted a word from the Lord himself. I'm going to tell you. There are times when nothing in the world beats hearing from God. There are times when there ain't nothing in the universe going to do the trick like hearing from the Lord. When I was called to preach at the age of eight years old. I was a nervous wreck. I had a terrible nervous condition as a kid. I had facial tics. I had all kinds of issues. It, it was terrible. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about because you've never had to see it, but trust me, it was a mess. I was a mess. I couldn't understand for the life of me how God could call me to preach and how God ever thought that I would be able to do anything for the kingdom of God. I couldn't get my mind around it. By the time I was about 12 years old, I was praying, God, please, Lord, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from your lips that this is in fact and indeed what you want me to do with my life. I, don't, I, I, I need to hear it in such a way, Lord, that I know it's from you. Now, when he called me to preach, I literally heard the voice of God. But all of a sudden, I'm 12, four years later, and I'm questioning, you know, and I said, Lord, I'm like John the Baptist. I'm coming to you, and I, I need a declaration from you. And I kind of fleeced the Lord. I said, Lord, if you could just speak a word of confirmation of my calling, if you could do it through a man of God that I really admire and I really respect immensely, then I'll know that I've heard from you and I'll know that this is in fact what you've done. And I've told the story before. I won't belabor it today. But Dr. C.M. Ward, one of the greatest Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled men of God ever to occupy the pulpit, came to preach for our little church in Connecticut. And we had to rent out a, a 
a hall, a big uh, school auditorium to accommodate him and the crowds that he drew because he drew thousands of people. They came by busloads to hear him from churches and uh, communities all over the state of Connecticut, all over uh, New England. Brother Ward didn't come to our part of the country a whole lot. So the fact that he was coming, boy, I mean, people took advantage. And you ain't never heard anybody preach till you've heard Dr. C.M. Ward preach. Ooh, brother, that man had a way about him that was so powerful and so wonderful. Week after week, I'm praying and asking God to confirm my calling. And to be honest, I loved my pastor, Brother Barlow. I loved Brother Barlow. And every Sunday, I'd go to church and I'd wonder, I wonder if today Brother Barlow is going to come to me and tell me that the Lord spoke to him about my call to preach. I wonder. I had it, you know, sometimes we think we know how God's going to do what we're asking Him to do. But the Lord always finds a way of one up in us. Amen. He always finds a way of doing it even better. Well, I kept waiting, hoping. I had it in my mind. Surely God will use Brother Barlow. He's my local pastor. He's a man I love and I respect. And I just expected Brother Barlow to be the one to do this. But he never did. Brother Ward comes to preach for us. And long story short, I, I've done some things uh, for Brother Barlow at the back of the the uh, auditorium relative to Brother Ward's books and tapes and what have you. And I heard that uh, Brother Barlow was loading up Brother Ward in his car. Uh, they were going straight to the airport so Brother Ward could get back to Springfield, uh, Missouri, where the Assemblies of God is headquartered. And uh, I had it in my head that I needed to get these materials and money to Brother Ward. Now, Sister Barlow told me later, she said, well, honey, we would have gotten it to him, you know. But I didn't know. I, all I know is what they asked me to do. So I went outside and I looked and Brother Ward's car was, uh, Brother Barlow's car was about, oh, maybe 30, 40 yards down the way. And Brother Ward was standing at the door. And Brother Barlow was opening the door for him. And I ran and I ran and I ran fast as I could. And I got there just before Brother Ward started to lower his backside into the seat. So he stood a moment. I said, Brother Ward, Brother Ward. And of course, I'm out of breath, you know. I said, uh, Here are the, here's the money and, and the orders and blah, blah, blah. And Brother Ward looked at me and I said, Oh, I've got to tell you what an honor it was to have you today, sir. I said, My Lord, I, I'm just thrilled to have had the opportunity to hear you in person. And Brother Ward reached out to shake my hand. And I reached out and I took hold of his hand. And when I did, he put his other hand over the top of my hand. All of a sudden, he's holding my hand with his right hand. And he's got his left hand over the top of my hand. And he looks me in the eye. And you got to know, Brother Ward had these big old jowls, you know. And when he talked, he had a certain hollowness about... The way he spoke, there was a certain hollowness there, you know. And he looked at me and he said, Young man, the Holy Ghost has informed me to tell you. And he literally said it with this diction. He literally said it in this fashion. It was, it was like he was speaking as clearly as he could speak. He, he wasn't speeding through it, nothing. Just the Holy Ghost has informed me to tell you that God has called you to the ministry. Even right now, I feel the Holy Ghost on me like, like somebody literally is just holding an electric wire against my head. I feel the power of God just thinking about this experience. I stood there and I, <laughs> I was transfixed. I was frozen in place. 
I couldn't believe what I heard. But more than that, I couldn't believe from whom I heard it. Hello now. I knew that if Brother Ward was saying it, you better believe he heard from God. Brother Ward ain't going to run around telling some young man that he's never met before, that he doesn't know nothing about. He's not going to be telling them that God told him that, you know, this young man is called to the ministry. He literally spoke a word of confirmation, and he knew he was doing that. He said, the Holy Ghost has informed me to tell you that God has called you to the ministry. That's the way he literally said it. Whew. John was in prison. His life was nearing its end. He wanted to make certain that he had fulfilled his calling, his life's purpose. He sent his disciples to the Lord because he needed to hear from the Lord. There are times we need to hear from the Lord. And we need to know we've heard from the Lord. But the Lord doesn't always do things quite the way we think he ought to do things. John expected his disciples would go to the Lord and ask him this question. And that the Lord would simply respond, tell John yes. That's what John expected. That's what John was hoping for. All he wanted was verbal confirmation that what he had done, what he had said, what he had proclaimed concerning the man Jesus was in fact true. And he could go to his grave with peace knowing he had done his job and done it well. But instead, the disciples of John come to Jesus. And the Lord says, boys, y'all just stand over here a while. I've, I've got some things to do. Just stand over here a while. And he goes on and he's teaching and he's preaching. He's laying hands on the sick and they're recovering. He's laying hands on the blind and they're receiving their sight. He's touching the ear of the deaf and they're beginning to hear. He's grabbing hold of the arm of the layman and he begins to leap and begins to rejoice. He lays his hand upon the one who has died and life is restored to their body. He preaches and his audience, listen to me children, is nothing but a bunch of paupers and folks that have no money because he wasn't preaching for an offering. Hello now. He was preaching the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God knows no boundaries. The kingdom of God is not designed to accommodate the rich or to accommodate the intellectual or to accommodate the uh, 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 expressly and overly religious. The kingdom of God is for whosoever will let him come. And Jesus is preaching to an audience of paupers and poor people. Finally, after a while, the Lord comes to them and says, Oh, by the way, about that question you asked me for John. He said, You just go back and you tell John everything that you've listened to me, that you've seen and heard. It's interesting. I believe with all my heart that in the Word of God, every word is, is in a proper order. Every word that God has recorded and has called people to record within the Word of God. I believe every word is in a special divine order. And you'll notice the Lord didn't say, tell John what you've heard and seen. He said, no. He said, tell John what you've seen and hurt. So what they had seen was more important. 
it was higher on the list of priority than what they had heard. What they saw was more important. And he said, tell John what you've seen and heard. And he repeats to them what they've seen and what they've heard. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And, the po and to the poor the gospel is preached. Notice he didn't say, and the gospel is preached. No. He specifies the fact that his audience was a bunch of poor folk. Well, I'll tell you something. You can't say that about a lot of your TV preachers today. You can't say that about a lot of your big name preachers today. Because I got news for you, honey. If the church ain't got enough money to invite them to come, they ain't coming. I've had... People in affirming ministry, LGBT affirming ministry, contact me. There's one couple that sings that are very well known in LGBT Christian circles. And I contacted them to, you know, find out what it would take to possibly get them to come and visit our church. And their quote-unquote manager got back to me and said, well, this is what they require. They require this amount of money, and they require that they be able to travel this uh, class, and they be able to do this, and then, then, then. And I wrote her back. I said, honey, never mind. I'm not interested. I said, furthermore, if our church ever gets to the point where we have 10,000 members, and a million dollars a month coming through. They will never step through the door of our church. They will never stand on the platform in our church. I will never allow these people to minister because it is abundantly clear to me that their ministry is not ministry but business. I'll tell you, I've been preaching a long time. I got a lot of criticism many years ago when I was preaching evangelistically because I preached in every church that invited me. I've preached in some of the smallest churches you've ever seen, and I've preached in some of the biggest churches you've ever seen. I've literally preached one time in probably what is the largest uh, one God Jesus name apostolic mega church in all of North America. And, uh, but I've preached in so many little tiny churches. I've preached in so many places where there were only 20 people, 30 people, 12 people, 15 people. If a pastor asked me to come, I went. If they gave me a love offering, I took it and was happy with it, whatever the amount. And if they didn't give me a love offering and they asked me to come back, I still went back. You know, a lot of people today don't understand when we ask for support or we ask for help. Right now, I'm at a point in my life where I'm not able to work anymore. The only thing I can do is fulfill my calling and do what God has called me to do. The only support I receive, the only financial support I get is through the church. That's it. That's the best I can do these days. I'm just not able to do more. If I could, I would. I did for years, didn't I, Booby? I've worked 60 hours a week nearly trying to run a, a, a thrift shop for our church so we could have a place to worship. And so we could, and I wasn't making a living from the thrift shop. That was just to pay the church rent and all that. I mean, you know, if somebody wants to know where Pastor Charles is coming from, all they got to do is don't come ask me. Come watch a while. I'm not afraid of anybody to come watch and see how I operate. I'm not the least bit concerned about anybody coming and watching me and seeing me and seeing how I do things. Amen. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you, I've been in places. I went to a conference some years back of LGBT affirming Pentecostals, supposedly. 
I was so excited. It was only the second conference I had ever attended in all the time that I had been in affirming ministry. I'd only started my affirming ministry a few years earlier. I didn't even know that there were others like myself. I took a bus because I couldn't afford to fly. I went to this conference. I was in a room in the home of the host pastor with a bunch of other LGBT affirming Pentecostal preachers. And I was so excited to be there. I was so excited to be around people who believed like I believed and who were affirming and oh, I was so excited. And I was just gushing about our ministry in New York City that we had started and what we were trying to do and what our vision was. And you know, because usually when I go to Church of God camp meetings, that's what us preachers would talk about. What we were doing in our local, we'd be sharing ideas and you know uh, telling war stories as it were and celebrating together and enjoying uh, feedback and enjoy you know that's what you do and as I stood there and I'm sharing all this I literally was watching these men in this room literally folks I, I can't even tell you it was the most disgusting display I've ever seen in my life I literally watched men in that room going There was not one who acted like he was taking an interest in what I was saying. Not a one. Not a single one. Every one of them looked like they were just aggravated and frustrated that I was wasting their time talking about these. And they weren't talking about similar things either. Then the host pastor who had invited me to come and practically begged me to come told me I could stay in his home and that, you know, I wouldn't have to pay anything once I got there because I didn't have a lot of money. I was living in New York City. I didn't have a lot of money. All of a sudden he said, well, you know, my house is kind of full, so I'm not going to be able to have you stay here with us. But I've arranged for you to share a room with this man at the hotel where we're having the conference and blah, blah, blah. And he takes me to this place, and I meet this man, and I was saying to the Lord while I'm in the car, I said, Lord, I don't understand why I was sharing all this exciting news about what we were trying to do and what we were, you know, engaged in and, and what my vision was. And, I mean, I'd have been just as happy to hear them tell me the same thing. I'd have sat and listened with glee. And I said, Lord, I don't understand why these men just weren't even interested. They, they literally acted like I was just bothering them. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, that's not why they're here. I said, well, if that's not why they're here, why are they here? And I'm going to tell you a little secret. God told me, and I don't like what he told me. And I've heard over the years many confirmations that what the Spirit of the Lord told me was right. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm not afraid for anybody to come spend time with me. We had a fella from, uh, I forget what town he's from now, but he was part of the... Uh, Evangelical Network, you remember? When we had our little church space over in Mesquite. And he was a leader in the Evangelical Network. And he called me and said he was in town uh, on some business or something. And he'd be interested in meeting with me. So I invited him to come to the church office. And you, Tommy, and I were there. And we met with him. And the whole time he was there, what did we talk about? But we, we talked about the Lord. We talked about the Word of God. We talked about affirming theology. We talked about the church. We talked about our vision the whole time. Never heard from him again. He never made any effort to stay in touch with me. Don't know why. I've had people come to our home who have followed us online. Amy, bless your heart if you're watching. You've come to our home. You've been in our home. You know. 
You want to talk to the pastor about the Word of God? I'll talk to you all day and all night. Amen. You want to talk about Jesus? I'll talk all day and all night. You want to talk about the goodness of God, the blessings of God? I'll talk to you all day and all night. Hello now. Tommy knows I'm telling the truth. I purposely don't do this to him because we live together and it would be an overdose. So I don't do it to him on purpose. But boy, if I'm given the opportunity, I will. My mother had a friend for many, many years. She passed away recently. She came to Dallas for our wedding. We'd known her for many, many years. She came to Dallas for our wedding. She was sitting in our living room. and I come out <clears throat> into the living room at one point. My mother was sitting there, and this lady was sitting there. And this lady was not a Christian. And uh, we started talking, and before too long, I started talking about the goodness of God, and I started talking about something related to the Word of God and all this. And this woman actually had the gall to insert a comment and say, uh, do you think maybe we could put all this on hold for a while, you know, blah, blah, we could talk about something else. I stopped, I looked at her. I said, honey, you're in my house. You're on my turf. We're going to talk about whatever I good and well want to talk about. And if I want to talk about God, and I want to talk about the Word of God, and I want to talk about the goodness of God and the things of God, you're just going to have to deal with it. Don't you dare ask me on my own turf not to talk about the things of God. You remember that, Mom? want to tell you today, folks, talk is cheap. Anybody can tell you they are what they claim they are. Anybody can tell you that they live what they're supposed to live and that they do what they're supposed to do. Hello now. Anybody can say, I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again Christian. We live in a nation today where millions proclaim they're born-again Christians, and yet at the first opportunity, they support a man who is so inept and so unqualified to be president of the United States that it isn't even funny. They support a man whose speech is vile and disgusting and offensive and vulgar. They support a man with no morality. They support a man who is so evil and so wicked and so heartless and so without compassion that he is willing to rip children from the arms of their parents and put them in cages made out of chain link fits as though they're animals. Not even make sure they have toothbrushes, not even make sure they have pillows. They don't have beds, they gotta sleep on the floor. After all, these people have come to our country seeking asylum. Therefore, we are under no obligation to treat them well, but you would be if you were following the law of Moses. You'd be under the obligation under the law of Moses to treat them as though they were natural born citizens, as a matter of fact. But the first opportunity these so-called born-again Christians get, they will support the most ungodly, wicked, evil, nasty, vulgar, putrid human being ever to walk the face of planet Earth. A man so consumed by greed that he uses the office of the president, which ought to be the highest honor, the greatest compliment that a man's nation can bestow upon him. And he uses that office to enrich himself and his family and to try to overturn and upturn our Constitution and to convert our constitutional democracy into an authoritarian oligarchy. Talk is cheap. 
The problem is not that Christians don't know how to act. The problem is talk is cheap. Just because someone calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean they're a Christian. Are you looking at what they do? Or are you simply taking them at their word? Because if you're taking them at their word, you're as big an idiot as they are. I've said it before, I'll say it again. When I teach on the paranormal and the supernatural, and we talk about the idea of demons uh, manifesting themselves and posing as ghosts, posing as the spirits of people who have died in a certain location and all this. Because by doing so, they give themselves... Uh, legitimacy all of a sudden when you have these ghost hunters and they say oh well we researched and we found out there was a man who died or there was a woman who died all of a sudden that demon immediately is looked upon as being legitimate okay this spirit has a right to be here but what cracks me up is every question they ask every answer they receive Tommy they immediately accept as fact mm -hmm. and truth. What kind of a moron are you? Do you accept every word that comes out of a human being that you can touch and you can feel and you can see and you can hear? Do you accept every word that comes out of their mouth as fact? No. All of a sudden you're communicating with something you cannot see. You have no visual on them whatsoever. All they're giving you are literally little tiny bites of words. There's never complete sentences. There's never complete paragraphs. There's never great explanations. This is all done on purpose. This is how demons deceive. I'll just give you a word that relates to this person's history or this person's life experience. Suicide. Oh, see, that's that person because they commit suicide. Blah, blah, blah. And immediately these morons are believing every word this spirit says to them because they're, they're hearing say, Really? Really? You just believe every word that somebody says to you, huh? I see people who are talking about experiences they've had at these locations and all that. And Tommy, I don't even believe every word I hear coming from them sometimes. Sometimes I watch some of these people and I think, you know what, I, I just get a vibe from that person that they're trying to get people to come to their hotel. They're trying to build their business up and they know if they can get word out that, oh, our place is haunted, all of a sudden people are going to start flying in, you know, wanting to be in a haunted place. And I've seen uh, these people talking to individuals and I thought, I don't even buy what that person is telling me, never mind what the the spirit is talking. Talk is cheap. Just because someone proclaims himself, declares himself to be a child of God, says they're a child of God, it by no means means that they are in fact a born again child of God. Jesus said, go back and tell John what you have seen and heard. Not just what you've heard. Oh, well, I've got to tell you, Kenneth Copeland is the most wonderful man of God I've ever laid eyes on in my life. Oh, his teaching is so wonderful. His preaching is so wonderful. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've just supported him and followed him for decades. Something wrong with you, lady. Why? Um, do you ever watch him? Or do all you do is listen to him? When the COVID crisis came about, there were millionaires in the secular community, secular millionaires, people that don't even uh, call themselves Christians, people who are Jewish, people who are Muslim, uh, Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates, who donated millions 
to causes that would help to find a cure and find a remedy to the coronavirus situation. And they've done this over and over and over again with any number of diseases and any number of uh, calamities and any number of disasters. They've done it to help people in America. They've done it to help people in Africa. They've done it to help people in Asia. They've responded to everything from tsunamis to earthquakes. Am I telling the truth? These are secular millionaires. Oh, but Kenneth Copeland can and brag that he is a billionaire. He literally has said from the pulpit that he is a billionaire. Um, did you ever see anything about Kenneth Copeland contributing to any, any disaster cause? Any. Have you ever seen anything in the universe about Kenneth Copeland contributing to the COVID crisis, to try to help financially with the COVID crisis. Do you follow what I'm telling you? The Word of God said if a man desires the office of bishop or pastor, he desires a good thing. There are many requirements for a, a man who would be a preacher of the gospel. And some of those requirements are that they not be greedy of filthy lucre. One of the requirements is that they be given to hospitality. I've got news for you. Unless you're way up there in the hierarchy of TV preachers and well-known famous celebrity preachers, the chances of you're ever darkening the door of some of these preachers' homes is about 0%. Because you will not be welcome. Am I telling the truth? Try inviting them to your home for dinner and see if they come. I was pastoring my first church. It's been a long time ago now, about 35, 36 years ago. I was pastoring my first church. I was 19 years old. We had a couple in the church, Judy and Tom, bless their heart. And uh, Tom and Judy. And Judy's mom was a Roman Catholic lady, sweet lady. Christmas Day came, and we had a Christmas Day service in the, in the early, uh, late morning, early afternoon. We wanted to give the kids time to open their presents and kind of go through their little ritual at home. And then we had our service, I think, about 11.30 or something. And of course, after that, everybody's going to go home and have family meals and celebrate, you know, the holiday. And this particular Christmas, Tom and Judy's uh, mother, Judy's mom, this Roman Catholic lady, came to church with them, which surprised me. She had never come before to our church. And we had our Christmas service, and after the service, Judy came to me and she said, Pastor... Uh, my mom would like to know if you'd be willing to come to her home for Christmas dinner. She said, I don't know if you have any plans or anything. I said, well, I probably would have just gone to my grandmother's. I said, it wasn't a plan. You know, it was just what I would do if I had nothing else to do. I said, but I'd be honored to come. I'd, I'd be thrilled to death to come. And I saw Judy go, and she told her mom, that uh, I was going to come, and I saw her mother break down in tears, and tears started to stream down her face. And I thought to myself, oh Lord, what did I do wrong now? What did I do wrong now? Maybe this lady was just being nice, but she really didn't want me to come. Well, I said I'd come, so I went ahead and I followed him out to the house, and this lady still had tears coming down her face. And I pulled Judy off to the side. I said, honey, are you sure your mom wants me here? I said, she seems awful upset, you know, for, for, I saw you tell her that I would come. I said, and she seems awful upset. She said, oh, no, Pastor. She said, you've got it all wrong. She said, my mother is so touched that you accepted her invitation. She is so touched that she just is crying. She says she literally 
was surprised even that a Pentecostal preacher would be willing to come to her home, her being a Roman Catholic. She was so surprised and so pleased. She said, that's why she's crying. Do you see what I'm telling you? Oh, I'm going to tell you something. You can talk till the cows come home. You can say what you want to say, but the proof is in the pudding. It's not about what you hear. It's not about what people say. It's about what they do. Jesus told John's disciples, Go back and tell John what you have both seen and heard. Are we living a life today that demonstrates our faith and our walk with God? Or do our words say one thing while our actions say another? In James chapter 2 verses 14 through 16, the Lord's brother James writes, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works or actions? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, without action, is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by his works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works, by actions, a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers? and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If someone wants to know whether or not you're a child of God, uh, do they have to go by what you say, or could they simply observe you for a while? And would your life demonstrate to them? Would they see by reason of your attitudes? Would they see by reason of your conduct? Would they see by reason of your actions that you are a child of God? That you believe God is real? That you believe hell's hot and heaven's real? Would they see or would they only hear? In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, I'm trying to finish today. We read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God.
And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to act like they were doing just like everybody else. Oh boy, we love the brethren. We love the church. We love the people of God. Everybody else is selling property that they own and donating the whole price to the apostles so they can distribute and make sure everybody in the church's needs are met. Oh, we're doing exactly what everybody else is doing. Talk is cheap. No, you're not. A lot of people talk is cheap. They think that they can talk a good talk and they've got God fooled. Oh, no, honey. You may fool men. You may get people to believe you. Like Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people all the time, all the people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time and you can't fool God at all. Think because you say something. Think because you talk the talk. Oh, I tithe. No, you don't, liar. You know you don't. I don't know why you waste time. I had an uncle that attended my first church. He and his wife and two kids. He's no longer married to this woman, and I hate to be mean, but she was a terrible liar. She made, she made uh, Donald Trump look truthful. This girl could tell fibs like they were going out of style. And my uncle believed, as my grandparents did, in tithing. See, I didn't have to ask my grandparents if they believed in tithing. I didn't have to ask my grandparents if they believed God was real. I didn't have to ask my grandparents if they believed the promise of God's word, that if you give, it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I didn't have to ask them. You know why? Because I observed them. My grandparents believed in tithing. My grandfather was backslidden out of church, and he still tithed on every nickel that came into his house. He would tell my grandmother, make sure you got your tithe on you, make sure you got your tithe. My grandfather was so committed to tithing. And if a missionary came into their home, they often invited visiting missionaries to come to their home for dinner. They wouldn't leave the house, but that grandpa would give them two or three hundred dollars cash to help them in their mission work. This is the way my grandpa, or Mike Listick would come, or others would come who were in ministry, and my grandfather would never let them leave the house without an offering. See, Tommy, I don't have to ask whether my grand, my grand, and, and my grandparents weren't rich. Some would call them poor. They were working poor. They, 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 you know, they had an old house that's kind of fallen around their ears because they had raised ten children in it and couldn't put a lot of money into the upkeep of the house, you know. But it wasn't like they were millionaires because they were not by any stretch of the imagination millionaires. But you didn't have to ask my grandparents if they believed God was real. You didn't have to ask my grandparents if they believed that God blesses those who give in support of the ministry, who give in support of the work of God. You never had to ask my grandparents that question because if you observe them for five minutes, that question would be answered. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Ananias and Sapphira 
said one thing but did another and God does not appreciate people who say one thing and do another. Peter said to him, it was your land. You can do with it whatever you please. You didn't have to come and tell us that you were giving us all of the money. If Ananias had come and said, Peter, I'm going to give you 75% of the money I made on that land, that would have been acceptable to God. If Ananias had come and said, Peter, I'm going to give you half the money I made on that land, that would have been acceptable to God. The problem was not that he didn't give all the money. The problem is he claimed he did, while in fact he didn't. Amen. Talk is cheap. In James chapter 3, 4 through 8, closing today. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You see, not only can we say something that isn't so, not only can we tell a fib and mislead with our mouths and our tongue. But our tongue can get us into a lot of trouble. You know, you won't talk about acting on Christ like we can act on Christ like a whole lot quicker with our mouth than we can with our body. Hello now. You're a lot quicker to say something you shouldn't have said than to do something you shouldn't have done. Am I telling the truth? Amen. I, maybe I'm the only person <laughs> who's guilty of this, but boy, I mean, you know, my mouth can get me into trouble a whole lot faster than my actions. I'm, I'm not likely to go out and commit adultery. I'm not likely to go out and commit fornication. I'm not likely to go out and do things I shouldn't do. But bless God, it doesn't take a whole lot for me to say something maybe I shouldn't have said. Am I telling the truth? But you know what the wonderful thing is? Even though the tongue can get us into so much trouble, here's the wonderful thing. People will sooner remember what you do than what you say. My grandfather, my mother's dad, bless his heart, he had a terrible temper. I think, personally, I think maybe he was bipolar or something. He had a terrible temper. He could cuss a blue streak. My God have mercy. He could cuss a blue streak. He made up cusses that had me laughing because they were so outrageous and goofy. Sometimes he, I just crack up because some of the some of the things he'd use, yelling at people in a car that cut him off, and the the things he'd say just had me cracking up. They were so funny. But you know something interesting about my grandfather? My grandfather was one of the most liberal, one of the most generous, one of the most compassionate, one of the most giving men I've ever known in my entire life. I've told the story before, and I'm almost done, I promise, a few more minutes. He bought a brand new great big tiller brand spanking new, got it in the mail, put it together, was showing it to my uncle Joe, who had four kids with my Aunt Faith. And Joe said, wow, Don, that is really nice. And boy, I'll tell you what, if I had something like that, man, I'd be, because Joe and Faye owned a few acres up in Wolcott, Connecticut. 
And Joe said, if I had something like that, he said, man, I could till up a whole acre of land and plant a big garden, you know, and that sure saved us a lot of money. Now, Joe was just saying this in the sense of what the machine could do, you know. He wasn't, he wasn't a desiring the machine. And my grandfather looked at me and said, well, then take it home. My grandfather literally just got this machine in the mail, just got it, just put it together. Hadn't even used it one time. And he says to my Uncle Joe, he said, well, take it home then. Go ahead, take it home. And Joe said, oh, no, Don, that, that's not what I meant. I went, and my grandfather said, no, no. He said, you've got four kids. He said, you can use it a whole lot better than I can. It's a lot more important than you have it. He said, you, you go ahead and take it home. And my Uncle Joe tried. He said, Don, honestly, you don't have to do that. You know, I, I was just talking in terms of what it could do, you know. And my grandfather calls my Uncle Philip and, my, and me, and he says, come over here, boys. He said, pick this thing up and put it in Joe's pickup truck over there. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. That was my grandfather, Tommy. That's how my grandfather was. I saw him do stuff like this so many times. He could cuss like a sailor. Because he cussed, was his faith in God not real? No, not by a stretch. The Bible tells us that our tongue is the loosest member we've got. Our tongue's the member that'll get us into trouble the fastest. Am I telling the truth? Because my grandfather could cuss and carry on, did that change the fact that he believed in the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Didn't change that fact one bit. When he retired... He had a reputation in his company in the factory he worked at, not for being the old man who cussed like a sailor's parrot. Do you know what his reputation was? He was a man that had a strong faith in God. That's what people said about him. They said, boy, that guy had religion. He had a strong faith in God. When somebody was sick, he'd say, well, we'll pray for him. When somebody was going through hardship, he said, we're praying for you. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? You see, it's not about what you say. Talk is cheap. Jesus told John's disciples, go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. If someone is observing your life today, are they observing Christ-like compassion? Are they observing Christ-like love? Are they observing empathy and sympathy for those who are suffering? Are they observing actions that indicate you believe God is real? Do they see you being charitable? Do they see you contributing and giving to the work of God? You see, one of the things about giving and tithing is that gives you an opportunity to get it out of your mouth and put it into action. People, I love people, say, I don't believe in tithing. Well, of course you don't. You don't believe in anything. That requires you to take your faith out of your face and put it in your fists. Hello now. A lot of people, oh, they have trouble with anything. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, because God forbid that would require you put action to your faith. I'm going to tell you something. Faith without works is dead, being alone. That's what James said. Faith without action is, being, is dead, being alone. You want to know I've got faith, honey? You don't have to believe me because I tell you. I welcome you to watch me a while. I welcome you to watch me a while. Watch me walk into a Denny's and see a homeless man in freezing cold weather sitting at a table without a jacket or a coat and asking him, do you not have a coat? And he said, no, sir, I, my coat got stolen. And what did we do, Tommy? I come to the house, I grabbed the best coat I had out of my closet, the one I loved more than any coat I had, but it was the only one I had that I thought would fit this man because it was actually a little too big for me. And I brought it right back to Denny's. I, I didn't give him the coat I was wearing. And then, no, I, I knew I had one he could wear at home. My favorite hunting coat that I had. I come to the house. How many people are going to leave Denny's, go to their house, get a coat, go back to Denny's to, to give this man the coat? How many people are going to go out? I'm not saying this to brag, but what I'm saying is, 
You don't need to listen to what I'm telling you. You need to watch. And then go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. Hallelujah. Why? Because talk is cheap. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.